Live from Paradise Studios in Massapequa, New York, it's Unger the Radar, starring Randy Unger. Brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a two to match your attitude. Tonight, Randy will be reviewing the new films At Eternity's Gate, Chef Flynn, The Rebound, and Green Book with special guest critics Amanda Vasquez, Rachel Kolb, and CJ Oakland. Randy will also be interviewing filmmaker Sanjay Raul of the new documentary 3100 Run and Become. And now, here's your host, Randy Unger. Hey guys, I'm Randy Unger and this is another edition of Unger the Radar where we connect movies and people one frame at a time. And I want to welcome my wonderful panel of critics, Amanda Vasquez, welcome. Hi. First time here. Yep. How does it feel? <laughs> Feels great, I love it. <laughs> nice, nice. Love the new set. Good. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. CJ, not your first time. No, I, I've been here like five times now or something, <laughs> yeah. right? Just a few. <laughs> like at this studio alone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just saying, you need more friends. I know, <laughs> maybe I do, maybe I do. Well, if you know anyone who's who's free, let me know. <laughs> no, then you'll start to get jealous. Oh, oh that's, no. good. Yeah, that's, that's a good I point. I can't get a spot on this couch, it's so comfortable. Damn it. <laughs> and Rachel Cole, welcome back. Yep, How's it you. going? Good, yeah. good, glad to be back. Cool, cool. So guys, we have a lot of movies to talk about, so we'll just get right into oh, it. Um, this movie, CJ, CJ and I are only the only ones who have had the fortune, or misfortune, to see it. Uh, <laughs> at Eternity's Gate, which basically tells uh, the later years of artist Vincent Van Gogh and uh, his relationship with Paul Gug Gugin. Gugin? Gugin? I, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I'll be honest. I'm okay. not as familiar with his work. Okay. Well, basically, Willem Dafoe is, to me, the only highlight of this movie. He's a great actor. He plays Van Gogh brilliantly. And yeah, it's a great performance. Yeah, um, but there was something lacking, though. I don't... Yeah, I, when we watch the movie, it's about uh, Van Gogh's life, and there's so much like we don't know about him because of his mental illness and mm. the way he was. There were a lot of rumors about him, so mm. there's a lot of things like there's uh, controversy over like why he cut his ear off. People mm. have differing opinions. Yeah. Like, if he possibly attacked a woman, and it's like things explored in the film that they don't show. Right. Mm -hmm. They just kind of like Hint cut from it, it yeah. and then people talk about it. So it's interesting that they're not trying to say one way or another what happened and explore more of the man. Mm -hmm. But most of the scenes, there's not a lot happening. Yeah. Like it's very beautifully shot. There's a lot of great uh, sequences in it. Right. Him drawing the art, like uh, the art that they use in the film, like looks incredibly well done. It's very right. truthful to Van Gogh's style, but. There's a lot of it where most characters are talking and mm -hmm. talking about Van Gogh, but there's no conflict. There's nothing mm -hmm. going on in the scene. It's not really building. To it's anything. really just. It's basically a, like a like a piece of art. Like you just look at it, and it's supposed to be beautiful. It's beautifully shot. The direction yeah, is it's amazing. Yeah, like you're watching a movie about Van Gogh. Yeah. isn't it so great? And it's right. like, well, what's happening? And it's like, it's Van Gogh. Don't right. you like it? So. <laughs> It is good, but it's like, I wish there had been more to it. And if you're a fan of Willem Dafoe, I don't know about you guys. Oh, very much a fan. So good. <laughs> yeah, uh, The Florida yeah, Project. I, I mean, mm. I wonder with this movie, maybe he was trying for an Oscar. Because oh, yeah. He because he didn't get it for The Florida Project, right. which I am still upset about. <laughs> <laughs> I could see a potential nomination, though. I don't know. Possibly. I don't know if he would win, but it's definitely a great performance from him. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very well shot. I was even more impressed by Oscar Isaac in this, actually. Yes, he was the highlight because yeah. he plays the other artist whose name we're unable to pronounce. No, <laughs> yeah. You hear it often yeah. enough in the film, unfortunately. <laughs> but another artist who was a contemporary of his who right. didn't become as famous in time. But he, him and uh, Van Gogh have a lot of conversations about right. how they view art, how they view the world. Mm -hmm. Like Van Gogh was a very big naturalist, but drawing an almost surreal style of mm -hmm. the way he saw the world, mm -hmm. which is still like what makes his art so beautiful. Right. And this person is saying, why do you only draw nature? Why don't you make things up in your head? And he's like, nature is interesting enough. Mm -hmm. And their conversations are the highlight of the film. It's like yeah. the best give and take. Uh, both of them do a great job acting. It's uh, great character work. I could have just seen a movie with Oscar Isaac. Yeah, I wish it was the, uh, the two of them. Like if they had been the focus of the whole yeah. movie, it would have been... Uh, a uh, great one. Unfortunately, like they have other actors coming in for small parts, which I feel kind of weighs the movie down. Like it feels like mm. a guest spot of, oh, this person happens to be playing a character now, and yeah. then this person's playing a character. But it's like it doesn't have the same chemistry. It doesn't right. have like the same weight. To so it. they weren't needed. The other characters. 
Not really, because it's like it tells his life of like him going from like the different towns and mm -hmm. him traveling in like a mental institution. He had to stay mm -hmm. there, so it's like they show what happens, but they don't really show in a way where it's interesting enough on its own. Like, yeah. if you have no idea who Van Gogh is. You're not going to see any relevance to this movie. You're like, why are we watching this person? Right. It's like, it's only knowing like, okay, well, this is happening to him because he's Van Gogh, and we know it'll be important later. I think a better screenplay would have made this a much stronger film, to be honest. Possibly. It would have tied like, things in a bit. Yeah, better. I think the director made this one, especially yeah. with a mind to like how it was shot. Like, there's so many sequences yeah. of Willem Dafoe walking through the wilderness, which I understand. Like, it's a big mm. part of Van Gogh's life, so I understand why it's there. But I feel like it gets a little self-indulgent a right. bit. Like, and it's a case of style we, over yeah, substance. Yeah, we can only watch uh, Willem Dafoe struggling to climb a hill so many times to so <laughs> go up and paint something. And right. it's like, I, I understand where you're going. I'm thinking it might require a second viewing, to be honest with you. but Possibly. Like, I'll give it another chance. Yeah. Uh, it's just hard to say. Like, there's definitely parts of the movie I liked, yeah. but not enough where I feel like I really recommend it to people as much unless you're a big fan of Van Gogh right. or art in general. And when it comes to Van Gogh, there's so much you can choose from in popular culture to watch. I mean, there's the Doctor Who episode. That, that uh, was a great It's fantastic. Oh, it? Tony Curran, he's fantastic. Okay. And, I, you I know, of course, one. there was last year's uh, Loving Vincent. I mean, mm. heck, even a good part of uh, Hannah Gadsby's uh, Nanette special on Netflix actually deals with Vincent Van, Van Gogh. Oh, it's, wow. okay. And it's fantastic. She gives a lot of background about his mental illness, and she goes, yes, my art history degree gets to come into, uh, <laughs> nice. into play wow. here. There you go. So, so right. better things to watch then. Yeah. So do you think screenplay will affect him getting the Oscar then? I'm not sure because again, like he Sometimes does a re does, he does a good. <laughs> it's a good. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's not terrific. It's just, I feel like there's only a handful of scenes to choose from where yeah. I'm like, Willem Dafoe really nails it here. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. a lot of it is seeing him just kind of walking and painting and doing things. Yeah. So it's like we see emotion in his face, like when he's doing it, it's a good job. But, but it's hard to work with. They, if you don't there's have not as much material with. as yeah. it could have been. Okay. I think uh, if we're if we're talking about Oscar season, I think Rami Malek will be taking the spot for good actor <laughs> yes. in a bad movie. So that, that bad might movie. already be taken. So. Really? Uh, okay. Eh. No, yeah, like, <laughs> no, it's like I enjoyed it, but it's definitely like they turned uh, the Queen's story into like the typical rock and roll thing. Like, oh, yeah. now the lead singer needs to go off and do his own thing, and it's like. It's Other classic. people were doing solo albums. Like, yeah. that wasn't a problem for the band. <laughs> so it's like, point. I understand they're classic. acting it up for drama, and it's like the movie, but he does a great performance. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. Oh, that for was a sure. Good movie. I hope he, get, really yeah. I hope he gets the, the, the win. He'll year. definitely get the nomination. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, so we got to move right along here. <laughs> um, and this one I think everyone saw, or most of you, uh, the documentary Chef Flynn. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> And basically, it tells the story of teenage culinary prodigy Flynn McGarry, who took the world by storm, basically, by hosting like restaurant tastings at his own house. And now he's working in Manhattan at like some of the most mm -hmm. posh restaurants uh, there are. So, Amanda, what do you think of Chef Flynn? I really liked it. Right. I liked the movie. I feel <laughs> like it was inspirational. Mm. Felt. It made me feel depressed, like I wasn't doing enough in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we all felt that. Because he started at, what, 11 or 12? Like, he 11, started so yeah. early. Like, no. at 11, I didn't even know. He knew what he wanted at that to age. To brush my teeth in the morning. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had to be reminded to do that. And he's like, no, I know what I want to do with my life. He already had his life down pat. Mm -hmm. With the help of, I mean, his, the help of his parents, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. I mean, you have to have good parents when you know yeah. what you want to do with your Super life. Super supportive mother. But he yeah. knew what he wanted to do with yeah. his life. Like, even if I had a supportive He turned his own bedroom into a I still kitchen. didn't know what like, I wanted to do. That was a lot of dedication. Yes. Like, I was it's very impressed by Keeping seeing notebooks yes. of recipes and formulas. And, wow. <laughs> his, I mean, his friends helped, too, but his friends didn't know what they were doing. Like, they, they just were followed him. <laughs> that, was, that was cool, though. <laughs> but very. it was a very inspirational movie. Yeah. Yeah. It showed the struggle. It showed how unsupportive the world is. Yeah. Like the world is extremely unsupportive. So mm. if you can get through the world looking down on you, then you know you can be great. Wow. Yeah, there are a lot of haters out there. Yeah, yeah. Especially in the New York food scene. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Rachel, what, what, what'd you think of the movie? Oh, I thought I thought it was really compelling. Um, mm. I thought especially his mother uh, being an artist herself. Right. She's a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah being a filmmaker herself. Did she, did she direct the movie too? Or? I don't know, I but don't she definitely so. shot like most of the footage for the mm -hmm. documentary. Yeah. Like everything yeah. from yeah. Yeah. It was a little, yeah.
Yeah, like, this is one scene where he's like, why are you filming this? Like, <laughs> you're yeah. so angry. He's like, stop filming this. I'm just being me. It's yeah. <laughs> awesome. She was proud. <laughs> CJ, what, what did you think of Chef Flynn? I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, very interesting story. It's like very charismatic uh, kid. And mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot to it where he comes out at 15 where he's cooking this classical food that mm -hmm. it would be hard for most chefs to be able to have a style like that and be able to do something with like that much yeah. depth. Like a delicate work to it, that kind yeah. of like yeah. uh, craft. The tweezers and the very yeah, like mm -hmm. it's <laughs> incredibly skilled work. It's crazy, and a lot of people were saying like when he comes out, it's like oh, he's great for a kid chef. for today uh the rebound which everyone saw yes, yes. okay cool cool <laughs> just checking mm -hmm. and i had the misfortune of watching everything you said <laughs> <laughs> thank you for bearing with me once again um the like rebound which is about uh wheelchair bound uh basketball players the, the what are they the miami heat wheels uh -huh. wheelchair yes. basketball team uh -huh. and how they basically overcome the odds and you know bias against dis you know, those who have disabilities and another underdog story actually mm -hmm. and um, this really <laughs> impressed me this really hit home I mean the, the struggles that these they don't even consider it struggles they yep. just it's just a minor thing in their life that they have to overcome and they do it and they have a most of them have a smile on their face Was, is when the one of the players he falls like on his side and he's like he gets he right, gets right back, back up. Yeah. That's so crazy. Just like a handstand yeah. with a, like a whole wheelchair behind him. <laughs> I love the scenes where there's one guy pulling like four or five other wheelchair guys behind him, and they're not even Crazy. assisting. Crazy. It's yeah, like, really. at that point, it's just athleticism. They're it's not the fact that... What ...happens in life, and also going against these other great athletes right. to try and uh, take mm -hmm. the championship. Mm -hmm. And having said it, it's almost like it's, it's more mental than physical. Like the body, the mind overcomes the, the hardships and they just, they literally press on. Yeah. Um, Rachel, what do you yeah. think? Um, I mean, it's certainly not the first time that wheelchair bound basketball has been brought up in popular That's culture. True. Of course mm. there was, uh,
so uplifting and I, I really hope people you know get to see it because uh, it really is special I, and I, yeah, I would out of all, highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love that. It's great of, to watch. I think out of all the movies we're, we're talking about tonight, um, this might be my favorite. Or equal to another movie we're going to be speaking about soon. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, The Rebound, definitely check it out. Yes, for sure. definitely, definitely. Nice. So here's another movie that CJ and I only got to see. Yep. Sad, and sad. This is another one I hope everyone we missed gets. Out. Yes. Everyone should see. No, everything. No, you ev did miss out. <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this. This movie. is this is an awesome movie. It's called Green Book, and it's basically a, a tale of racism and friendship during the 1960s. I really want um, to see it. Basically, it tells the story of a tough guy from the Bronx. He's like a bouncer at the Coca Copacabana, uh, played by Vico Mortensen, who gets uh, hired as a driver for this. Uh, Black pianist, uh, played by I'm gonna butcher this, <laughs> Mar Marshall Mahershala Ali. Mahershala yep, Ali. Mahershala. Yes. Yep. Oscar winner. Oscar winner. Awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's a shortened version of his name. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> that's oh, a shortened version. That's scary. <laughs> but basically, it's a tale of um, it's a dramedy about both of these gentlemen who basically bond over you know he has to drive him into the deep south and he's faced with extreme racism and unfortunate events. But again, they overcome it, they get through it, and it's a beautiful tale of friendship. CJ, since you're the only one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
Well, that's Green Book, and I hope you ladies see it yeah, eventually. Yes, absolutely. I highly recommend it. It's coming out on the 21st, I think, on yeah, Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's, it's out now uh, as a limited movie. release. It's a Thanksgiving Thank, movie. Yeah, it's coming Thank out you. soon, though. Yeah, and Mahershala, he's going to be in the next season of uh, True Detective, right? Uh, I, I think so. I believe True he was Detective. announced to be in it, so he's having a pretty good that's, year. He's having a really good year. Yeah. Really good couple of years. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah. a great actor. He's, he boomed. Yeah. He boomed. This, I didn't yeah, no, see I, uh, I like a lot of the stuff that he's been in. I hope there's Oscar buzz for him for this role. I've a lot of things that he's been in. I feel really like uh, Viggo Mortensen and him are both like co-leads. Like I don't know one mm -hmm. of them is really more no. of a supporting actor than the other. Like we spend a bit more time with Viggo Mortensen, but he, Rehearsal is really like the driving force in the movie with his character. Yeah. So I don't know if they would call that supporting actor, but it's like. That's a good point. I think it's, a, yeah. Lead. It's They're kind of equal. They're it's definitely worth an Oscar nomination. Mm -hmm. He does such a great, powerful performance yeah. with him. So we'll see what happens with this one. I think it's, it has a bright future. And it's an uplifting story for the holiday season. So oh, yeah, like I definitely want to go take my family to see it and like go see it again. Like see it again. nice. I'm excited to watch that movie again. It's very well done. Nice. Wow. Yeah. You got CJ's vote. <laughs> <laughs> and I like it too. All right, guys. So we are now at the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which everyone saw. Yes. <laughs> it is now on Netflix and it is a Coen Brothers production and it is a Western anthology of six interesting sort of very different stories about the frontier about greed and and revenge and very existential themes a lot of things going on here uh amanda what did you think <laughs> i did not like it you all. oh <laughs> no i really didn't i tried to find things i mean i guess if i had to find like well are you really a, do you know the coen brothers are you, are you a fan i feel like most of the things that they've made i have not liked really <laughs> So it is an acquired going taste. In, yeah. I already had an idea that I might not like it, but I okay. still gave it a chance. Good. You did say it was six stories. Yes. Some of the stories I like more than others. Mm. I feel like if I really had to try to find something I really liked about it, uh -huh. it would definitely be the way it was shot. I feel like mm. for Westerns oh, yeah. in this day and age yeah. and using like technology and everything i feel like the way it was shot as a western was really good yeah. um but well, the Collins have a great eye they, they know what they that's doing. what i feel like i feel like the director's eye was good yeah. mm -hmm. i just really didn't like the movie itself uh, you didn't like the stories or the the acting i mean i even with different different stories is hard to do as well but mm -hmm. i feel like if they're gonna do different stories i expected them to come together somewhere mm -hmm. have some characters I they might do that some yeah. as well yeah. with Buster Artists. Scruggs right like, yeah. like he would be the mm -hmm. the, like the, cre the crypt keeper yeah, they, they <laughs> even really the last are just scene alone, I expected like... to show like okay now this connected all of yeah. nothing yeah. Mm -hmm. it was just th random six stories, stories out of a book yeah it was just yeah. six stories that's a good I mean, point I'm used to reading books that's like a collection of short stories that aren't related so it's like me watching this like Especially because the overarching thing is it pretends like there's a book on the table True. of the Ballad of Buster Scruggs right. and other tales of the frontier. Like right, that. right. So it's like you see like the hand turning it, so it goes a different chapter. So I'm like, I wasn't expecting it to bleed through. Like yes. it wasn't an anthology where it's like different stories happening That's simultaneously. The, I, like, I thought I thought I Buster Scruggs was like, like the that. like the host of the anthology. Like that's kind of how they promoted it. I think. I thought yeah, he would have been. It's in like all you six. see them all jumbled yeah. together. So I thought like okay maybe there would be overlap. But yeah. Yeah. when it started showing the book, I thought well you're not really gonna have characters from other stories show up. Like mm. so I wasn't so much surprised that they didn't connect. Okay. But there's a lot of like it connects on certain themes i think uh, the theme i think okay. is the yeah there's a thematic connections to them which is why they put them together but they said right. like they would kind of stand alone on their own but they rather they preferred like putting them all together i think each of those stories could have been a standalone film i don't know about mm -hmm. film for that long but definitely yeah. like for a 15 20 short minute film. short i mean i, I feel like that's them. what it was though short yeah. films yeah. Yeah. For that's each pretty much them. what it was like you kind of view each one on its own but they all have a similar mm -hmm. feel. They're supposed to mm -hmm. give yeah. you like a similar emotion, I think. With the Western and the death and everything. Like, yeah. I feel yeah. like that was the connection between them. But yeah. they weren't supposed to marry each other, I think. And that's what mm. I didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> you want a connection. I understand. Rachel, what'd you think? I know you had some thoughts. Yes. I, this was a very mixed bag for me. Um, <laughs> there were two segments in particular that I had a major problem with the James Franco segment um, and mm. the. Uh, the girl who got ra the gal who got rattled, which was the segment with Zoe Kazan. Mm -hmm. um, in both of these segments, they're the they are the only segments that feature any characters of color in the entire film, mm. um, Native Americans. And in both of these instances, they do not get any lines. Mm. They yell, show up, scalp some white people, 
and then leave. Mm. And we get no sort of perspective on them. It's in, and some people might argue, I had a discussion before coming here about this. Um, some people might argue that's supposed to be them doing the way that Westerns are usually done, but it's like- oh, Like it's a character. But character, it's, yeah. it's 2018. Like a Cowboys and Indians type yeah. thing, I yeah. guess, but. But it's, it's 2018. We do know those stories from speaking to people in, like among various Native American tribes, we do know more of that perspective now. And it's very strange also that in 2016, the Coen brothers were called out for not having, like, I think aside from Oscar Isaacs mm. in Inside Llewyn Davis, there's nobody in their usual roster of actors that are people of color. It's almost mm -hmm. entirely white. I think the huh. only one I can think of is just John Turturro, who only appears in uh, Big Lebowski mm -hmm. in a supporting and role. Arthur, yeah. Oh, like, and yes, and No Brother Arthur. And Barton Fink. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, okay, great. Okay, so we've got two. <laughs> we've <laughs> got two. Just more to forget John Turturro does movies. So. <laughs> but in 2016, they got called out for this with Hail Caesar, and they made a point mm. of like saying at the time that they were going to, I think they said that they were going to try to do better, and this seems like a huge step backwards. Yeah, <laughs> they they didn't do better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, I understand the idea that they're doing an homage to Westerns and, like, the way they were done. And even from back in those days, like, books written during the time of the Old West was the idea of, oh, just, there's an Indian attack now and happens. Mm -hmm. And the movies, mm -hmm. like, growing up, the John Wayne ones, like, all of those films are just, now the Indians attack and they have no yeah. perspective, they have no say. So I understand why, if you're saying, I'm going to do an homage to Westerns, so yes, it'll just be an Indian attack. But it's also just because they did that at the time doesn't mean it's not racist to do it now. Yeah. Like, it mm -hmm. definitely, like, I would have preferred if they had done, like, almost a classic Western style tale, but about characters who are Native American and showing it from their perspective. I think it was, like, sort of an, an homage to the movies of, like, the 50s and 60s. In, yeah, in that like, there's definitely ways It wasn't, to, like, like, an insult The Western to literature, like, it wasn't meant to be an insult. It wasn't meant to be a racist thing. Yeah. It just really feels like they were like, okay, so we have all the Western tropes, including the Indian attack, and like, well... They're the only people of color in the movie, so don't you think there's a problem with that? I don't think I can yeah. see that. that's a thing that occurs to them. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think it was a conscious decision. Right. It yeah. wasn't. Yeah. When you have more diversity in Blazing Saddles than you do in... I mean, Blazing Saddles <laughs> is meant to be 40 the years ago. Western. That's the way it was written. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Are you yeah. guys... Fan oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Are, are you guys fans of the Western film genre? Amanda? No. <laughs> I, I am. I, or CJ. And my dad used to watch a bunch of Westerns. Nice. I watched them on my own, so it's like... I watch those movies and like I enjoy the kind of simple stories they tell. But even as a kid, I'm like, wow, the Indians in these movies really get the raw end of the stick. And knowing history mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is so much even worse than this. So why don't the movies try and do anything to change it? But it's like, that's yeah. the stories I was told is it's written by the people who write the history book. So yeah. it's the story of white people taking over this land that nobody happened to be there, except occasionally Indians attack and that was it. And doesn't. Mm -hmm talk about the genocides that happened. Right. So like there's a lot of history that the that like the history books don't show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. the movies and like the westerns are meant to be a glorification of it. Like mm -hmm. the idea of like cowboys being these uh, grand heroes and then just ignoring all these other aspects of what happened. So yeah. a movie meant to be an homage to westerns would be played this way. But it still doesn't mean it's not problematic. That's like true. I mm -hmm. yeah. agree with you wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. So do you yeah. guys think that um, history is not properly represented on film? No, absolutely not. It's definitely and, not. It's and, getting a bit better, but yeah. no. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's what you guys just said you liked about Green Book, that it was mm. so different yeah. than normal racist movies. Like, yeah. it showed a different aspect. It showed the African-American guy in this sort of role, and the white guy yeah. in this, like, they showed yeah, difference. Like, the like, thing, thing I love best about Green Book is that it's actually named after the Green Book, which right, was right. the mm -hmm. green uh, so African-American motorist. For motorists, mm -hmm. during, yeah. yeah. And the idea was, they actually black people felt the need to actually write an instruction manual saying if you travel through the south these are the towns where they'll have restaurants that'll serve you food. These are the hotels. Yes. These are the places, yeah. these are the hotels you can stay in. And yeah. these are the towns that if you stay here after dark, you will be murdered. So see, yeah. it didn't and change that was history, yeah. but it showed a different take. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the Green Book always existed. That was always a thing, but yeah. you never had movies talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's true. And yeah. coming back to Westerns again, um, I mean, of course, if you want to see a different perspective Western from the Coen Brothers perspective is True Grit. Oh, yeah. Remake yeah. of the John Wayne movie. Get, you get a young yeah. exactly. female perspective. That's right. true. Right. It's Wonderful. It's very true. And I guess you could sort of say No Country for Old Men is sort yes. of a Western. Oh, That's like the a modern, modern Western. Yeah. 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 Definitely Great a movie. modern one. It's yeah. definitely a modern day Western. Yeah. Love that movie. All right, guys, so a few minutes left. Uh, what are we looking forward to seeing in theaters? Green Rachel. Book again. Green Book again. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mary Poppins <laughs> Returns. Oh, yeah, Emily Blunt. Very oh, good yes, casting. Oh yes, I want to see that one. Nice. Widows. Oh, Widows. Widows. It's out now. That yeah, one looks yeah, really good. I yeah. really want to see that. Great cast. You got Widows looks so good. Viola I don't know. Davis. It seems like what they were going for when they did um, Ocean's Eight. Yeah. Like, but oh. didn't do because no one liked Ocean's Eight. But no, this I was like, I like, like Ocean's Eight. Ocean's Eight was good. Yeah. 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 Everyone no. I come into contact like, with didn't like it. So I don't know what you guys like about it. Ocean's Eight is a great yeah, movie. Yeah, it's a what good you guys movie. thought about it. No, it's a good movie. Is it? Like, it's a lighthearted <laughs> comedy heist movie, movie, which they have. It's exactly what it looks like. Yeah, it was exactly the vein of the other Ocean's movies, like Ocean's Eleven. It's like it's exactly in the same way. Like it's just starring a different cast, but they're doing the same thing. And Widows is the dark crime thriller version of it. So it's like. We have yeah, like see it. three or four <laughs> heist movies come out a year, mm. so it's like we can have two heist movies with women that go on opposite as a genre. It's like keep making more, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah, is there any connection more. to the Ocean's Eleven movies? In Ocean's it is. Yes. Like she's uh, Danny Ocean's uh, sister. That makes yes. sense. So it's like the guy who does the original one. She's the sister who just got mm. out of jail. Okay. Mm -hmm. And once put a crew it. together. Because everyone it's I come into like, contact with, I went and saw it. I'm like, this is actually good. Like it's a great heist film on its own, and also they play the character so well. I'm sure the chemistry is great between. The women. Mm -hmm. It is like I the fact that they're women. Out. They're able to explore this in an angle that the men can never do. Like right. they go like the way of like they're attacking a fashion gala. So it's like okay, we need to get the find the celebrity, get them to wear this super expensive like royal diamonds, so mm -hmm. the men wouldn't and find a way to, to go that. in there. Yeah, no, yeah. like it's okay. a very feminine way of like seeing like this is our access to this event. Mm -hmm. How can we use this to our advantage? Yeah, yeah and sure. getting to use the Met as the space where this whole heist is taking place has nice. so much possibility. So it's oh yeah, and it was beautifully cool. shot. Like it, no, wow. it looks good. <laughs> You guys are don't really. Yeah. I don't know who said they didn't like You're it. You're like, talking so it up. People, if you don't like lighthearted comedies, then I guess you won't like it. But it's like it's a good fun romp. Yeah. Rachel, what are you what are you looking forward to seeing? Oh, definitely um, Widows and Mary Poppins Returns. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember what there's something else that's coming out right before the end of this month. Something else that I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to. Do you know who's in it? Oh goodness! So I know. many good movies. Well, I'll tell you guys if, if you if you're looking for like, just a, a decent quality dramedy. Um, can you ever forgive me? Yes, I've been With waiting to see that. Melissa those. McCarthy, mm -hmm. phenomenal. It's based on a true story of this mm -hmm. woman who forges these old letters uh, written by celebrities, and she passes them off as her own by adding a little P.S. at the end of it and selling it for for profit. And yeah, she gets into a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> yes. great performance by Melissa McCarthy, and I might have to see it again actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard wonderful things about that one, and I have been waiting for Melissa McCarthy to get this kind of role. Yeah, that serious yeah. type She's of role. She's great. Yeah. Like when she does drama, she does drama. I know. Yeah. You she know? really does. She just brings so much to it, kind of like the way that Steve Carell did when he first started oh. really doing mm -hmm. good dramas. Mm -hmm. And you just reminded me of I think my favorite movie of this holiday season yeah. that I really want to see. Welcome to Marwin. Yes, that yes. one I want to see. That yeah. looks really well done. Well I've heard that one. Mm -hmm. it's, um, we'll talk about it after because I don't think we have time. We do. Oh. We don't, but <laughs> basically directed by Robert Zemeckis, who did Forrest Gump Back to mm. the Future. And it tells the story of a man who was brutally injured. He actually survives this attack by the, like, guys that like, were bullying him and they assaulted him. And he has to recreate his life and his memories mm. by creating a small town of like action figures wow. in yeah. his backyard. Yep. Definitely look up the trailer. It's a <laughs> wow. good yeah. It looks yeah. interesting. It, There's a lot to it. I see an Oscar nomination for Steve Carell in this one. Hopefully. So, yeah, You're he's hoping. great too when, when yeah. he, goes, when he does drama as well. When yeah. you go review that one, call me because I won't get <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a, a plan. All right, guys. So we are going to go to a short commercial break from our sponsor. But when we get back, um, we will have my interview segment with filmmaker Sanjay Raul of the new documentary 3100 Run and Become. Here you go. Under the Radar is brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a tood to match your attitude. Patent pending interchange genuine gemstone and crystal EMF protection jewelry. For more information, please visit magnitudejewelry.com or call 
know you're you, you lived in Queens. I'm actually a Queens native. Um, tell me a little bit about your time in Queens and how that helped you out with the film that have inspired you and, and all that. The, the film 3100 Run and Become focuses on a really esoteric, unusual, almost unclassifiable uh, running race, a 3,100 mile race, which takes mm-hmm. place all around the half mile loop around the high school in Jamaica Hills, Queens, right. um, bordering the Grand Central and another high school. It's in a, one of the most ordinary areas that one could ever imagine a race like this. Hmm. And I've, I've lived in Queens since I was 22 in 1997, um, and you know, knew of the race, watched it, but only really begun, began to understand it in 2015, which is when I started production on this film. Now, and what was the inspiration behind the film? Making well, it? I, I kept seeing runners, the same runners coming year after year to run essentially 60 plus miles a day around this block in Queens for 52 days, and it, it seemed crazy or outlandish to me in the beginning, but right. I saw that many of them had you know, do treat that race almost like a pilgrimage. Um, and I'd, I'd been a runner in high school and a little bit in college um, and, you know, always had an affinity for running but never looked at running as a spiritual activity. Right. Uh, so that that's what kind of intrigued me to dive more deeply into that race. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, too, I also ran in high school. I was on the Far Souls track team. And, yeah, just running, it's such a solitary sport. Like, it's just you and... It's, it's just totally like it's like meditation in a way, and it's, it's yeah. I didn't really appreciate it back then, unfortunately, but seeing this film now, I can definitely make the connection. You know, I I, I was the same way. In, in in order to to really bring out the spiritual themes of running, you know, we we branched out um, from that block in Queens to uh, the Navajo Reservation in Arizona to the Kalahari Desert in Botswana, Africa. Um, and to the the, the mountains in uh, central Japan um, to to really show how there are still a few traditional cultures that look at running literally as a means to enlightenment. I I I don't know if if you know if you got the same thing out of, out of uh, the movie, but one of the things that we wanted to instill was exactly that that running is pretty much a metaphor for life. So yeah, in the film, you know, we focus very little on the actual physical action of 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 the running, but the right. ab- absolutely unique reason why some of the people in this film run, and it's kind of unlike any other, you know, running film that that I had seen, which is why we wanted to do this. Right. And now, did you have in mind the New York City Marathon, which just took place uh, the other day? Did you have that in mind um, for this for the release of this film to coincide with that? We we, we did. You know, we, we we released it in New York City or before the New York City Marathon because mm. you know. The, the city's just running crazy during that time. Right. And so we, we, we had a great run there, and we're opening in L.A. this coming Friday. Um, but then we're releasing digitally on December 12th on yeah. you know, all like transactional platforms, iTunes, yeah. Amazon, et cetera. What were some of the challenges you faced during production? Well, one of the things that we tried not to show in the film was how difficult the production was. I mean, it, 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 shooting in New York City is not a big deal. I mean, we were on the same block for, you know, a couple yeah. of months. But we had to go to Botswana. We had to, like, live in, in the Kalahari Desert and travel and hunt with a, a group of Bushman hunters. Mm. You know, when we were in Japan, we were filming a traditional running culture, which really hasn't allowed film crews up there in, mm. in nearly 40 years. Um, wow. the, the Navajo, as well, haven't really allowed anyone to capture the, the, the literal prayers that they, that they use when they run. Um, so in essence, getting access to all of these stories in order to bring them out to the public was probably the most challenging aspect. Okay. Well, what was the editing process like? Well, our, our, our editor, Alex Mellier, was you know, he's, he's a champion. Um, and, you know, from the very beginning, we talked about the story because we knew that we didn't have the time or the budget to film a Verite-style documentary and just capture hundreds of hours of footage in these mm-hmm. far-off locations. Yeah. So it was critical from us from the beginning to capture things that we knew would drive the story forward. And so well, in the 3100, for example, you know, not much happens. It's, it's a two-month-long race. Right. Um, so we had a sense of 50 or 60 things that might happen. And so we were just, you know, basically waiting there on hold 
until we saw those types of dramatic moments happen um, and filmed them and then kind of constructed it um, in the edit. How did you go about picking your subject? Yeah, so our, our, our main character, Ashrihan Alto, is a, a paper boy from Finland. But, you know, he's run, he's raced more miles in New York City than I think anyone ever has. Wow. He's, he's run the 3,100-mile race, you know, 14 times now. He's done a bunch of multi-day races, which are held in Flushing Meadow Park. Oh. And his cumulative mileage racing in the city or in parks in the city is more than 53,000 miles. That, wow. I mean, that's like doing 100-mile training weeks for 10 years straight or <laughs> racing a marathon in the city every weekend for 39 years. It's unimaginable. He's, he's like the, be- the, the best runner that no one has ever heard of. And that's his character, like you saw in the movie. He lives in a, a cabin in the woods. It's inspirational. The, I, I just love the fact that you, you focus a little bit more on the, on the personal side of these people rather than the actual sport. Uh, which is kind of secondary. Like these people, they're, they're running for themselves, really. We, we we wanted to make a film that would inspire people, and yeah. you know, information only goes so far. And there's great books out there, like Born to Run. But mm. you know, we want we wanted to literally show people the the heart of global running culture. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you hope audiences take away from 3100? I mean, that, that that that's a really good question, Randy. You know, we 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 found that people from the kind of most hardcore ultra runners to people who don't run at all, really take something special out of the film. And the only way I can characterize it is, I mean, you and I are, are, are speaking on election day. And yeah. there are so many things where we could find differences with one another. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you remember, like, from your, your cross-country days, mm-hmm. you, know, you, you never thought to question anyone's politics or ethnicity or background when right. you ran with them, when you ran with them. Right. And it's one of a handful of activities, like you know, sharing a meal, you know, you know, may, maybe you know, going for a walk. But mm-hmm. th- there's very few things where people can just enjoy being human. And I, yeah. I, th- I think we try to show that from the, the the Africans to the Japanese to our European characters, um, the Native Americans. You know, there's mm-hmm. something completely unifying uh, mm-hmm. about their running. It, it asks people to really focus on the reasons why they run. Yeah. And, you know, we, we all run for spiritual reasons, even if competition is our, our day-to-day life. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, very few of us are, have the ability to run just for a paycheck. Um, yeah. And even those that do need to be getting joy out of it to go through all the grind. All right. and, and I think by seeing cultures that have literally used running as a means to spiritual happiness, I think it gives us a frame of reference for all the reasons why we might run. Uh, did you do any running yourself uh, during the making of the film? You know, it's interesting that you ask because I, I, I felt like in order to get into the spirit of things, I had to be like doing 80 to 90 miles a week, right. um, particularly <laughs> during the 3100. Because, you know, when you show up there and these, these men and women are doing 60, 70 miles a day mm-hmm. and, you know, they ask you how your run went, you can't just say like, oh, I did a good two miles. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I had to, like, you know, show them that, like, in my own way, you know, I was, I was really pushing myself. Um, and, and that way we could have a lot of really good conversations that would spark getting the type of material that we needed for the film. Did you have a favorite um, person that you featured in the film? I, I really gravitated towards Sean Martin, our Navajo character, just mm. because of what he taught me about running. Again, that running's a prayer. You know, your feet are on Mother Earth. You're breathing in Father Sky how running is really a, a teacher. And lastly, you know, like you said, running with other people or training with other people, you know, running is considered for, for a lot of Native American Native American cultures um, a celebration of life. Mm. And, it, yeah, it really, it really showed me how every day's run can, you know, literally make me a better person. And what in your mind, what makes a good documentary? You know, that, that that's a good question because I've, I've, I've made – films that are more topic driven um, you know that my, my previous film was on farm worker uh, right called food chains right. um, and but at the same time that that film was structured around um, in, uh, in, in essence a, a, a hero's journey mm-hmm. um, it's it's really really hard these days with you know most of our viewing done online to keep people engaged for a full 75 80 minutes right and you know so we have to look towards narrative filmmaking and the types of tricks that happen, like on page 10 of a script um, or minute, you know, five of a movie 
um, and really understand that people are so used to watching narratives that they expect certain things to happen in a story at a certain time. Mm. And the documentaries that I, I've enjoyed, that, and I think a lot of people have enjoyed, have have kind of, you know, they, they, they've, they've hewed to the same principles. Mm-hmm. Um, they understand what people expect when they see a film, and they understand, you know, how to keep the story moving. Well, um, at this time, I'd like to actually invite you to just maybe just plug the film. Uh, when will it be released? Where can people see it? Thank you. Well, the, the film's website is 3100film.com. Uh, the film is going to be released digitally on, on December 12th. Great. Well, that was awesome. Sanjay, thank you so much for today. Um, again, the film is great. I loved it. It's, it's inspirational, and everyone really should see it, and I hope they do. All right, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, before we go, I just want to make some quick plugs. We've got the new Ernie Kovacs, the Centennial Edition, uh, from Shout Factory. It's a comedian in the 50s who, if you're a fan of his, he's pretty interesting. He does a lot of prop uh, humor. Prop, he's a prop comic, and he had his own show during the 50s. So this basically has everything, pretty much everything that he's ever done. And, uh, yeah, it's out now from Shout Factory. And also, I want to turn it over to my panel. Um, do you guys have anything to plug? Rachel? I have two quick things to plug. Um, well, actually, first, my uh, Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Rachel E. Kolb, Kolb with a K. Um, two things to plug. Um, I recently went to go see Head Over Heels on Broadway. It's wonderful. You should go see it. There are affordable tickets available for students and basically for anybody. Rush tickets available through Today Tix. Um, it's basically a fairy tale, um, but it's with music by the Go-Go's. Um, so it's like a rock musical. And then second thing I want to plug is uh, Kevin, five exclamation points, which is a parody of Home Alone, is coming back to the People's Improv Theater again this year for the holidays. Um, I know that their run starts November 30th, and I believe it runs through December 7th. So definitely go check that out if you're a fan of Home Alone or just want to feel like happy Christmassy. Go see it. Nice. Cool. That CJ. sounds like a good show. I nice. know, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You can find me on Twitter at uh, CJ Oakland. Okay. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's all I have to plug. <laughs> For now. <laughs> That's more than me. <laughs> I, have no- I have nothing to nothing? plug. Nothing? Being awesome, maybe? I guess so. <laughs> okay. Hashtag awesome. <laughs> and uh, on a more serious note, I want to uh, mention the, the recent passing of uh, Marvel legend creator, Mr. Stan Lee, he passed away uh, earlier this week, and um, he was a great uh, inspiration to for a lot of the movies that we review here on the show. And his work, his 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 uh, output over the years has been incredible. And we just want to thank him for his wonderful contribution to art. So yeah, uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, my wonderful panel of guests today. And also everyone watching at home and on your devices all over the world. Hopefully you're watching. And uh, yeah, we will be back next week with another edition of Under the Radar. I'm your host, Randy Younger. Take care. Under the Radar is all new next week with more movie reviews and interviews on Strong Island Radio and Television. Stay tuned. We'll see you next week.